Hey guys, welcome to a brand new video. Today, I want to find out if a 14 year old digital camera can still stand up in 2018. Let me introduce you to the HP PhotoSmart R707 from 2004. This was actually the family camera that we have used from November 2004 until July 2010. At this point in time, HP wanted their cameras to be small, quick, stylish and easy to use so that they could compete on the ever-growing market. Looking back at some of their previous offerings, I can see why they wanted to make that change. The R707 was one of the first cameras to have this new focus, with a lot of other models following suit and having the same or very similar design. So let's look at the design. The metal front is very stylish, especially considering that a lot of pointy shoes back then and even now have cheaper plastic bodies. On the front we can see the HP logo, flash, viewfinder hole and autofocus light. The camera is 5.1 megapixels and features a 3x optical zoom and 24x overall zoom. Of course, as with a lot of cameras and camcorders, they advertise a crazy high zoom, which in reality is optical zoom mixed with digital zoom. Yuck. The focal length is 8mm to 24mm, or 35mm to 117mm equivalent. On the back of a device, oh uh, yeah. So HP decided to go with a rubberized plastic bag, possibly to make the device feel better or something. Regardless, the plastic does end up melting over time, leaving the device sticky and catching everything around it, such as dust and whatever these white things are. This is an issue that a lot of other electronics have, such as the Gizmondo or the Amstrad PDA600, although here it's not as bad. The thing also stinks massively of mold, as my old house had a mold problem. Anyway, on the front we can see the optical viewfinder, as well as the absolutely tiny 1.5 inch TFT panel with a 320 by 240 resolution. We can also see the power switch that broke after I used it a few times. Yay! On the top of the device we can see a mode button as well as a half press shutter button and a video record button. On the left side we can see the power plug as well as mini USB, on the right side we can see a lanyard hole and on the bottom we can see the battery slash SD card compartment as well as the optional dock connector which I don't own. So let's turn the device on, or let's not because the thing was really pissy about accepting SD cards. I have two 128MB SD cards that were originally used with the device. Both of them technically work, but the camera has problems reading them. The first one shows up as needing a format, once you try to format, the screen just flickers a few times and that's it. The second card sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, you have to be patient with it. Oh god, it's actually locked up. Uh, I've took the SD card out, it's locked up. To unplug it. Really? God, it's- what? It's- <laughs> oh, this is great. I also tried a 2GB SD card that I have for some reason, and that gave me much more interesting results. The camera just dies when you insert the card. And usually when I want something to happen on camera while recording, it never happens, but yet, here I was recording this footage, and look what happened when I plugged in the AC adapter with the card inserted. Whoa, what the fuck? Oh, I didn't have that happen before. It's just a white screen. That camera wasn't even on technically. Oh yeah, also, once the camera actually started with the SD card and I took it out and I got a kernel panic. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, the camera only supports up to 2GB SD cards. I have no idea what happens if you try to insert a modern SD card and I don't have a spare anyway, so there's that. The camera also has 32 megabytes of internal storage, 27 of which is dedicated to your photos. You can store 10 high quality 5 megapixel images or 175 VJ images if you're a madman. The built-in storage is also slow as tits, so maybe it's better to forget about it. Right, now that we have a compatible SD card, let's actually use the device. There are a lot of functions and options which you wouldn't expect for such an old camera. For example, there was a 3fps burst mode, although it only takes 4 pictures. Still, there is also manual focus for the times the camera fails to get the correct focus. There is also macro mode, thank god, because the camera doesn't want to focus up close when in normal mode. This is because the minimum focus distance in normal mode is 50cm, and in macro mode it's 18 which is actually not terrible. There is also an aperture priority mode, however there isn't a manual mode or a shutter priority mode. You can however change the ISO from 100 to 400 which I believe is standard for a point and shoot. There is even exposure bracketing in case you want to take HDR photos, although of course the camera won't blend the images for you. Now with this camera, HP was really proud of the new features that they included. I saw them being mentioned in reviews, on a sticker that came on the device, and even in a secret demo screen that you can activate by holding down the live view and playback button for a few seconds. These are Adaptive Lighting, Red Eye Removal and Panorama Staging Preview. Adaptive Lighting is a tool that is supposed to extend the dynamic range of the pictures by brightening up the dark areas, and that's literally what it does. 
It just identifies the dark areas and brightens them up in post, of course leaving in noise. I'll show you guys comparisons later in the video. Speaking of noise, when taking a low exposure photo, the photo will actually be taken twice, once for identifying noise and removing it, which is actually quite smart. Alright, let's go out and take some pictures. And if you think it's simple as that, you're wrong! Yeah, the battery's flat. I mean, it has been used for 6 years, and it's 14 years old, so no surprise there. It still holds a charge, but enough for like 10 minutes of the camera being on, so I have to be quick with the picture taking. Once the battery is flat enough, live view will disappear, meaning that you have to use the optical viewfinder. And since this is a mirrorless camera technically, it means that the way the viewfinder works is by having a hole that's somewhat close to where the lens is. This of course means that the pictures you take with a viewfinder are slightly off the way you align the camera. You can still control all the functions of the camera even when live view is off, which is nice. Alright, let's go out for real. So I just got back home and I'm actually slightly impressed. By the battery. So it's a 14 year old battery and it lasts to 20, 20 to 25 minutes on a 40 minute charge. It's, it's, it's way more than I thought it would last. I thought it only last 10 minutes as I wrote in the script, so it lasted over double of that. The live view was off on the camera for the majority of the time because I couldn't physically turn it on. Although, there were times where the battery would just, instead of being on like very low, it'd be on like low to mid. So it'd actually be able to use live view, but then it, it would fluctuate. The voltage and the percentage would just fluctuate. So I'm definitely expecting the composition of some of these pictures to be just completely off. Something else I didn't expect is the optical viewfinder to zoom when you zoom the lens. I thought it'd stay stationary, but it's actually mechanical, which is pretty neat. So anyway, I've uploaded the pictures onto my computer and let's look at them. Right, so here are the things that I've noticed within all the images that I took. The first thing is that sometimes parts of the images are sharp in all areas. If we look at the first image, we can see that the bottom right side is really soft. The middle left side is less soft, but still soft nevertheless. The bottom right corner is also soft, while the bottom middle is completely fine. The middle of the picture is also not very sharp. This picture, however, is very sharp in the middle, with only the aforementioned sides being blurry. The second thing we can notice is the chromatic aberration. The third thing that we can notice is that the white balance on a lot of these images is completely off. Here, the dry grass is supposed to be yellow, but yet it's orange. The fourth thing we can notice is that some of the pictures are out of focus for no reason. It seems that when you zoom in, the camera is more likely to defocus. Now, let's look at how the camera performs in different scenarios. In the first image, we can see that the sun is facing directly towards the camera. This tests the exposure and the dynamic range of the camera. It did alright considering the conditions. The cow is dark and the sky has highlights blown out, yeah. But on the screen, the picture looked almost completely black, so I thought you wouldn't be able to see the cow at all. Let's talk about the screen for a second. It's quite dark when you're in a sunny environment. You can just about make out what's on it. My phone screen in comparison was nice and bright. Anyway, the cow's head is almost completely in focus. It's not quite there, though adding in a bit of sharpness in post fixes it. We can also see a lot of noise on the cow's head as well as in the shadows. We can also see depth of field. The cow's torso and the actual background are blurred, which is very nice. Here we are looking at the zoom capabilities of a camera. As you can see, the zoom should be used for cropping in or something and not trying to get something in the distance as it doesn't extend very far. This sort of image is actually very hard to capture because it needs to be taken in a way where you can still see the details in the shadows while keeping the picture exposed correctly and we can actually see a lot of detail within the dark areas of the picture. However, the grass is completely overexposed, which isn't too surprising. We can also see some blurring on the top of the image and the colours are also strange. The colours on the next image are even weirder. You can imagine that in real life, things weren't so orange. The picture also suffers from the same problems as the previous ones, such as overexposing in the lighter areas and blurring on the leaves. With these two images, I tried using manual focus, however the screen is so tiny I couldn't see what I was doing, hence why they're out of focus. When comparing these photos to the ones I took on my phone, there are common differences in every photo. My picture took very dynamic and contrasty photos with vibrant but unrealistic colours. The HP took a more bland but accurate approach, other than the completely wrong white balance. My phone also added sharpening in post, plus has a higher megapixel count, which means that there is more detail in the distance. You can also see the difference in focal lengths. The HP is 8mm, while my phone is 4.2, which gives my phone a wider field of view. With these pictures, you can see that my phone's picture has a darker shadow, however everything within is still visible and the grass isn't overexposed. The color is actually more accurate on my phone too. In the next picture, you can see that even my phone is overexposed, which shows just how difficult this picture is to take. So that's it for the first series of images. However, I didn't want to judge a camera on just 20 minutes of picture taking, so I went out to take some more pictures to try out adaptive lighting, try to figure out why the pictures go out of focus, etc. And let's take a little break though and look at the video quality from this camera. You see, this camera is capable of taking 320 by 240 video. It looks pathetic nowadays. However, for a long time, if you wanted to take good quality video, you would have to have a camcorder. Even our following family camera took terrible looking video. I do love this lo-fi look, probably because it's nostalgic to me. Anyway, I'll shut up now so you can hear the audio that comes out of the camera.
So here's a video test of what the video looks like and what it sounds like. I am currently underneath a tree, so I wouldn't be surprised if you can hear a lot of noise and not hear me very well. Although the audio quality is pretty bad in the first place. Right, so I've took the second series of images. So firstly, let's talk about how some pictures turn out blurry. My theory was correct, it seems that when you zoom in, the pictures end up looking terrible. Not all the time, mind you, but more often than not. Let's also talk about the white balance. You can't fix the orange dry grass. The sunny mode is the most accurate and that's what it produces. The white balance mode after that has a little tree on it, and that produces very orange pictures. I remember how one picture was very orange? Yeah, so the camera sometimes chooses that white balance instead of sunny. In this example, it happened on 3 out of 4 pictures. Finally, let's look at the adaptive lighting. Like I predicted earlier, all that it does is brighten up the shadows. It doesn't do anything with the exposure or anything like that, so overexposed pictures are still overexposed. As I said previously, the camera takes seconds to process the image, and when you choose to use an adaptive lighting mode, the processing time is even longer. Remember how I said you can take HDR images? Well here you go, this is what my edits look like versus the original photos. This one was annoying to edit, so if it looks terrible to you, that's why. The camera has an image advisor mode, which is actually pretty cool. If you take a picture with a slow show speed, the camera will advise you to put it on a tripod or use a flash. When you take a picture in macro mode, it will tell you how you should use it. If you take a picture like this one, it will tell you to use adaptive lighting. That is very smart and for people who don't really know what they're doing, these tips could actually be useful. The camera also has a help guide in the menu that tells you all about the camera, which is once again useful to beginners. This camera also has panorama stitching preview, as mentioned in the demo mode. What this does is it overlays the previous image on top of the viewfinder to help you line up the shot. It looks super cool and it works. The camera doesn't stitch the photos by itself and expects you to use the provided PC software to do it with. Final thing I want to say before I wrap up is that the camera also added a pixel. Or 2. Or 94. The camera has been able to automatically adjust itself to get rid of them, which is nice. I know I didn't really test it in any environment other than in a sunny field, so I'm dropping in a slideshow of some images taken in the past. The camera, like most other point shoes, doesn't do a great job in darker scenarios, dropping the show speed down causing blur from handshake. Overall, I think the camera did really well considering it came out 14 years ago. The pictures are still usable. They're not as good as my phone that came out 2 years ago, but they're not terrible either. And my phone is a flagship, so there are probably mid-rangers or low-end phones that take worse pictures than this camera. Yeah, it has plenty of problems, like most images being soft or some images being out of focus when zooming in, but the fact that the camera can still compete 14 years later is impressive. However, when focusing on other aspects than the image quality, that's where the usability of this camera falls apart. It only accepts all these decals and has problems reading them, the battery is old, the screen is small and dim, the processing isn't fast, there's noise in the shadows, the thing is sticky, falling apart and crashes. So there's also that aspect. So what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. I've did some research about the technical aspects of the camera which I will drop down in the comments below if you guys want to read that. But anyway, thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.